Up Now, a conversation about instant gratification with Kofi Amu Gottfried, Chief Marketing Officer at DoorDash, whose incredible journey has taken him from Ghana to Silicon Valley, where he was named one of Forbes' entrepreneurial CMO 50 for 2023. He's joined by moderator Shogun Oduolo Wu, host of Boston Globe Today. Good morning. Thank you all for being here. You are not so much to hear from me. You are here to listen to Kofi. And because this is the speed of culture, I am Nigerian, he is Ghana. Where we are in African culture, you never show up to talk to a chief without an offering. Oh, let's so, go. So, let's go. So if we're going to start off with culture, OK? Thank you. Thank, ah, you. Thank you. The chief. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you. So to that respect, Kofi, culture drives businesses. What have you learned in your time here at DoorDash that you see the culture shifting or that you've had to keep your finger on the pulse of it? I think one of the things that's been like really fascinating in the five plus years I've been at DoorDash is um, customer expectations and culture just ratchets up every year, mm -hmm. right? So every year people expect more from us on each side of our marketplace. If you think back to you know, Prime, when Prime was launched, many years ago, and it was two weeks shipping. That, that was amazing. Today, if you talk to anybody about two weeks shipping, <laughs> they're looking at you crazy. They'll slap you in the face, <laughs> right? People want things yesterday. So, you know, what was acceptable a year ago is no longer acceptable. 45 minutes was good a year ago. People now expect it in 40 minutes. And that's not just true of speed. It's true of every dimension of our marketplace. People expect us to have more selection than we did a year ago, right? So if we had all the restaurants in the neighborhood, people now expect us to have the hardware stores, the florists, the alcohol shops. It's like, how do you get me everything in my neighborhood and how do you get it to me now? People expect that to happen with super high quality. So we, we've just found that you can't actually outpace mm. the customer expectation. And so the, where we find ourselves is constantly being in this position where you're listening super hard all the time, trying to figure out like where customers are going next. And they, they show you in lots of ways. They show you in their behavior of how they use the app how they might use it for a use case that you didn't intend. And then that teaches us what we need to go build. They show us through their feedback to us. We get it through our support lines um, when we get all the complaints for all the things we got <laughs> wrong the night before. And so we get all this feedback about where those expectations are, and then we try to adjust to meet them. All of that is great. And I'm, I'm hearing an echo back. But all of that is great, right? But speed, and I want it now as the consumer, right? That is the, that's the plague, I think, for businesses. It's like the consumer says, I want it now. You want to deliver it now, but how do you ensure quality? How do you ensure where we want this instant gratification as the consumer? I want to order whatever I can order from DoorDash. I want it as fast as I possibly can. And now your job is tasked with ensuring the quality. How do you maintain that? Yeah, and I think the, the thing to say is people do not accept any trade-offs in that environment, right? So if I deliver you your grocery order and I deliver it in the 30 minutes, but there's 15 mi missing items, I've just ruined your day. Absolutely. Right, because now you have to go back and deal with all of these things that you didn't get. So a lot of what we think about is like, actually, how do you build a system that works super well to ensure quality and speed? So for example, we will have things in our product on the software side where when a driver, a dasher, is within you know, five minutes of a restaurant, it actually fires off a signal to the restaurant for the fries to go into the fryer. Okay. Right? So think about that for a second. Like that's like, you're not just, the experience you're having as a customer, but on every part of that journey, we have to be optimizing all of it so that when the dasher gets to the restaurant, he gets to pick it right away. He doesn't have to wait. It's that food. detailed. Yeah, it has to be. Because the restaurants also have, they also want the instant gratification of like, this order is out on the desk and now it's out the door. Because if you're the restaurant, you're like, hey, I don't need 15 delivery drivers waiting in, in my waiting room because that affects the in-room dining. So we have to think about every part of the system and optimize it consistently. But now, the consumer is not thinking that, no. right? You are, you are on, the, on the business side, you are looking at problems that you need to, you know, fires you need to put out before they even pop up. That's right. But consumers are fickle, 100%. right? I want this today, I want that tomorrow, and you have to stay on top of that. So how do you create the culture, a DoorDash culture, yep you know, create the wave while the consumer itself is still kind of competing back at you saying, yeah, we might change tomorrow and want something different. How do you stay one step ahead to still deliver what the consumer needs? Yeah, so I think the fundamental thing we think about is like, one, you, you have to over deliver on your promise, 
And our promise is really simple, which is that like, we want to be the thing that helps you navigate the complexities of everyday modern life, right? Like you, I don't know if you have this, but you know, I, have a, I was away yesterday. I have a 10-year-old and 9-year-old. I got home at 9 p.m. last night. 9-year-old got into our bed because you know, he had a nightmare. Right. I don't know what that's about. Um, <laughs> got into our bed. Um, wasn't feeling well. I literally had to order Advil last night to my house. Woke up this morning. I was running out of the house, so I didn't make breakfast. Ordered donuts. But like, my life is chaotic. That was also a humble brag of how you have it all. Yeah, right. It's chaotic. Like, like I, I felt it. And, you know, this is, I felt that. You know? if, if give your son <laughs> Advil at 9 p.m. is a humble brag. Yeah, right. Well, it was I don't a beautiful family, and then the order the Advil, and the donuts, and the order the, the donuts, donuts, the super father. I, no, I, I get it. No, no, I have a four and a half year old. I, I felt it though, yeah. but I got you. Yeah. No, but my point is like our lives are really chaotic, and so the role that something like DoorDash can play for me, at least as on the consumer side of the business, is being able to ideally meet those needs and even better being able to anticipate them, right? So being able to understand based on my behavior in the app, what am I most likely to do next? How does the app become more personalized for me each time I use it? How does it start to anticipate like what types of stores I want, what types of deals and discounts I might be interested in, um, what types of selection it needs to bring to me? Um, and you, you know, we have this product Dash Pass, which is like our membership program. So like as someone who's part of that, like how does that save me money and time every time I use it? So a lot of what we try to think about is like, how do you really get ahead of that? And you can't solve every problem, but we found that if you constantly deliver on your promises, that's how the consumer relationship just gets stickier. What happens if you anticipate something happening and it doesn't occur? Mm -hmm. So in our business, in the news, right, everyone wants you to break news. Everyone wants to be the first to the story and get the story. And oftentimes you're competing That's right. with other companies or other news outlets that may not have the same integrity as you. They'll get it out first, but there will be mistakes. 100%. How do you compete with people that are willing to be first and maybe not be as detailed while still creating you know, the culture of DoorDash so that there's repeat business, 100%. there's brand loyalty. Yeah, so we, the thing that we try to anchor on is trying to solve for the long term. So there's a lot of things you can do in the short term that will get you the business. Mm -hmm. um, but if you do things that destroy customer trust, for example, if you'd say, and you know, we've had some of these challenges ourselves, just like you know, we will run a promo, but if you run a promo that's super rich, and then it gums up the, the operations of the merchant, for example. As we've seen partners do that, where you go like, free lunch for everyone. It's like, that's a bad deal. <laughs> okay. Right, that's bad for everyone. It's bad for the restaurants, because now all of a sudden, they're all getting slammed with all of these tickets. It's bad for the customers, because they're going to have to wait longer. And so there are these things that look good on the surface, but actually bad experientially. So a lot of what we try to anchor on is like, how do we make the customer experience great? And how do we build something that we know will bring a customer back in the long term, not just in the short term? So for example, we study like retention curves for every customer cohort we acquire. So we understand that like if we acquire 100 customers at the beginning of the year, how many do we expect to still be us by the end of the year? And how does that change based on our actions and based on our behavior and based on how well we deliver on our promises? So more about retention. 100%. So long, so long term growth as you see it is the retention. It's not so much amassing all of these new people, it's but basically how much can you keep not how much can you get. I mean, you have to do both, but you have to be great at retention. Okay. It's, it's relatively easy, I mean, it's hard, but it's relatively easy in any business to acquire customers, because you can get stuff away for free. You can do things that like, make people very excited to try a product for the first time, um, but that doesn't guarantee that they'll stay. And the only reason they stay is because you continue to deliver on your promises. You know, so like a really good example is, we have this product that we built, um, maybe three years ago, which is like a really good reaction to like customer expectations. We saw that when people were using the DoorDash app, they would make an order, and then they would go on to make an order, another order in the next 10 minutes. Mm. Sort of go like, why are people doing that? Well, it turns out, maybe I'm ordering dinner, but I want to get a bottle of wine. Maybe I was ordering um, chicken tenders from this place, but I like the fries from that other place. Maybe I want to get ice cream after my dinner. So you go, okay, like that's expressed intent for a product that allows me to order from multiple places at the same time. So we went and we built that product. It's called Double Dash. Mm. And so, and with the value that creates for the customers, it says, after you've made your first order, I'm gonna give you 15 minutes to order something else from all of these stores that are around the first store. It's great for the Dasher, because yeah. they now get like two orders, they get paid for that. It's great for the customer, because they're not paying for that second order, because we have the same driver delivering it. 
I mean, it's great for the marketplace because we're able to drive more value. So a lot of what we think about is can you see a behavior that's happening in real time? Watch how people are hacking your product. And then how do you go out and build something for so it? So do you identify this behavior, this partnership, right, this dance between the business and the consumer? Who is really driving it? Because what you've just described makes perfect sense for both the businesses and the consumer. Is your thought process always what is going to work best for both or what's going to work best for us as a business and then the consumer will come along? And it's the reverse. Work backwards from the customer. Okay. Like there's no, we have this value which is like being um, consumer obsessed and not competitive focused. So there's a, in any business there's a lot of noise. Right? There's lots of things happening in the category at any moment, lots of things that our competitors are doing, lots of things that are popping off in social feeds, lots of ways you could respond. What we try to do is like, go back to like, what does the customer need? Because if you can solve that problem, the business will always come. If you go the other way where you start with the business, um, and there's times when we like, may be more business forward, but inevitably it's not sustainable because you cannot create a need that does not exist for people. So and understanding what it is that they actually need and building for that, we have found to certainly be the most durable, the most sustainable way to grow. How do you hear your customers? Again, if I, if I talk about my business, if someone writes an article or someone watches the show, if they don't like what they see or read, we have instant comments. We get emails, we get inundated. But if in your business, if I don't like the driver or if that person was eating some of my fries or, you know, like... like that I, never happens. Yeah, never. To be you clear. Know, half my pizza doesn't have pepperoni. <laughs> but, you know, how do you hear your customers in order to serve them better to make that partnership work? Yeah, we have, um, like you in the news, we actually have lots of avenues for feedback. So one, you're going to get ratings and reviews on the restaurant orders themselves. Um, you're going to be able to rate the driver, so we're going to get feedback on that dimension. We, our socials, are always inundated um, with people telling us, like, hey, you got this wrong. We have a support team that gets lots of inbound support um, from the marketplace, right? So if someone does an order and it goes wrong, that will get kicked into support. For people that are really um, ambitious, they will send that to me. Like, all of us inside the company do support. So you're getting letters like I Santa. I will get an email like, like Santa, but it's not a Santa letter. <laughs> it's not a Santa letter. It doesn't letter, sound right? like how somebody would talk to Santa. <laughs> you know, Monitoring sounds, who's been naughty or nice. Yeah, exactly. It's a little different. The tone is not how people ask Santa for stuff. Um, but we get all of that feedback. And so all of us do support in the business. Like, one of the other ways we do this is we have this um, piece of our culture, um, which is called We Dash. So everyone at the company is required to dash, which is to make deliveries themselves. All the way from our CEO to me to every single person who works at the company has to make a certain number of deliveries every year. And why is that? Because you get to actually see the business in action. You get to understand the customer pain point. You get to understand what happens at the restaurant. Um, and then you come back and we have a Slack channel. Wait, so there's a chance that I'm in New York and I'm ordering Hell a yeah. chopped cheese? And, 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 and it's going to be me. And it's going to be you yes. delivering my chopped cheese. Yes. OK. 100%. Um, <laughs> And then we have a Slack channel, which is amazing, because everyone who goes out and does these dashes, thousands of people, then come back and share feedback for the product teams, the ops teams, who are then seeing, OK, this went wrong. The map wasn't quite working here. There was this issue. I was in an apartment building, couldn't find the unit. And all of that goes back to making the product better. So we're like a learning organization. Obviously, we work with folks like Susie um, in terms of like interviewing customers, understanding customer feedback, and then piping all of that back into our system. So that's a really core part of how we operate. How important is the, that partnership with a company like Suzy and all of this feedback yeah. to that instant gratification yeah. where you can, you know, it's sometimes, again, using my business, it is often hard to turn a battleship as it's moving. Yeah. If you've been doing it this way and you have met with some success, it is often difficult or it is often, you know, met with apprehension yeah. or even sometimes outright hostility. We don't want to change yeah. this business model. Yeah. But if you're saying that the, it's more consumer-based, right, that you follow the consumer, is how difficult then is it for you all to turn in an instant if you hear like the consumers aren't liking this? Can you change? Are you nimble? We are very nimble. So I think we're built like in our DNA as a company. Another one of our values is like bias for action. Like we run a daily business. So every day we get feedback. Every day we know how many orders we did. We know how many that was versus yesterday versus last week versus last month. We have all the user ratings and reviews. We know how many were. Uh, missing had like defects, how many never, were never delivered, how many had missing and incorrects. 
how many dashes had an issue using the red card that they used to pay, how many merchants um, maybe had like a charge that they weren't supposed to see. So like we get this level of information daily and we act on it daily. And so like that is how the business is built. And I think a really good example of our agility is if you go back to 2020 um, and how we responded during COVID as a business, when yeah. you saw sort of the world shut down and you know, delivery became a lifeline. And we had to arch and re-architect literally our entire business overnight to be able to like pivot to say, how do we meet the needs of all of these people in real time? And some really tangible examples of that is like we changed how we paid dashers in a week rather than paying you monthly. Wait, you like, changed how you paid dashers uh, in a week? In a week. So you went from being able to say, hey, you get paid once a month or once every other week. It's like, no, at that time, people needed instant pay. So I need to get paid today. So we had to rebuild a product that enabled you to get paid today, and that happened in a week. We became one of the largest procurers of public protective equipment. And that's something that like, the, market, the marketing team built. Like the pipeline for all the PPE that went to the millions of delivery drivers that were on the road. And we had to build that in a week. We had to change. Today we all think of um, the default option when people deliver stuff, yeah. which is like leave it at my door. That wasn't a thing. Like, everyone assumes that, but four years ago, they handed it to you. Yeah, you, yeah, you got it with a little stapled. <laughs> yeah, you, you would get it from the driver. Yeah. And so in COVID, you all of a sudden had to change all of that to a totally different protocol, which is like, leave it at my door. And so we had to write all of that, ship it in a week. All of us went to like onboarding restaurants. Do you see that, do, do, you, do you see that companies, when they, when, they fall at, when they fail at that instant gratification, yeah. when they fail at meeting the customer where they are? Yeah. Because what you've just described is not only meeting the customer where they are, but for the time that both the customer and the company were existing. 100%. Do you see that more, more companies are either going that way or the ones that succeed go that way and the ones that are failing don't, don't realize that you do have to be that nimble? Yeah, I think my, I have this general view that like, Brands only matter insofar as they solve like problems for customers uh, or create opportunities for customers. And I think the greatest brands and greatest businesses have always done that better than their competitive set. I think that's the number one thing that probably differentiates like a good business from a great business. It's how well do you understand your customer? How quickly can you respond? Um, how can you over deliver on their expectations? How can you delight them? And I think when we all of us talk about like the great brands and businesses that we all love, either in our personal lives or from an industry perspective, I think they all have that in common, whether you're talking about Amazon or Nike or Walmart or Costco or, you know, um, any, any brand you can insert here. Like, they do that one thing better than their competitors. How do you identify who can be part of your ecosystem mm. where you've got this model that is customer forward, you know, customer centric, we follow the trends and the needs of the customers. How then do you look to see who you're going to partner with? That, that, do they have to share that same vision? Do they also have to be dashers? Like what, how, do you, how, do you, how do you build that out so that we, the consumer, like if there's a brand that I like, yep. I'm gonna see them on DoorDash yep. tomorrow or, you know, a week from Yeah, now. I mean, it's, it's a really good question. And I think there's some partners that share that DNA with us, but not every partner does, and they don't have to. I, really quickly, I just wanted to pause. Yeah. Um, you said that what I asked was a really good question. And from a Ghanaian man giving that to a Nigerian, <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that that <laughs> everybody captured. Everybody got that. Yeah, I just wanted to yeah. make sure that the I, cultural I, war. Actually, I'm taking it back. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to make sure Terrible that. Question. Did they get that on camera? Because that's what he said. It's a great question. I know it hurt him. Let's do it. But you all saw I it. had to do it. It wasn't good. Um, no, but I, I think for us, it's like really trying to work out, there are partners who share that DNA, who are great in the way that we go to market. Um, but then there's a lot of partners who we're actually helping bring into the space. If you think about like the fundamental problem that DoorDash is really trying to solve, is the fact that over the past 30 years, as like the convenience economy has grown and the world has moved online, local businesses have been left behind. And why have they been left behind? Because they do not have the technological know-how, they do not have logistics expertise, they do not have a fleet of drivers. So this whole thing is built on the premise of like, how do we take this thing and bring it to you and enable you to compete in a world that's changed around you? The mom and pop shop. Exactly. And for those people, like they will not be, by definition, be built like DoorDash. They're built very differently. This is, you know, your hometown Ghanaian restaurant that makes the best jollof in West Africa and in the world that everyone is aware. No, he knows. <laughs> he, knows. he knows that that was a dig. There's, there's a cultural war between our two countries about who has the best, there's a best specific jollof rice. Nigerians say us, Ghanaians, 
say Nigerian, but <laughs> no one's proud, but... No, but okay, a yeah. Ghanaian restaurant yeah, that makes jollof like, rice. Like, but, like, they're not going to be, like, the most technologically advanced, nimble. Like, that's not what they're doing. What they're doing is making a great dish and providing hospitality to their customers. And so for those partners, we come in and we hopefully, as we partner, can help them be more nimble. We can help them be more technologically savvy. We can help them reach more customers. And so that's how we think about it. We don't expect everyone will be like us out of the gate. But as we partner, we expect that we can bring some of that to businesses. When you're thinking of the culture that you are trying to create, that, that it, the culture that you work with, the culture at DoorDash, do you look for individuals, diversity? Like, I want you to kind of speak yeah. to companies that, you know, a diverse room yeah. allows you to be nimble because 100%. you're not focused on one school of thought. So 100%. how do you all maintain this kind of cultural currency yep. with the one that you're trying to build, but also hiring the people that you're going to work with. I mean, it's critical. So if you think about our business, we have something like 32 million monthly active users. We have something like 2 million weekly active dashers. We have 550,000 merchants on the platform. That is people from every single walk of life. In many cases, particularly when you think about the restaurants and the dashes, those people are immigrants. The people of color, if you think about who it is that starts small businesses and small, like it's really driven by immigrants um, and migration. So a lot of what we think about is like, you need that perspective in the room. You need people in the room who understand these communities um, in order to be able to speak their language. And that even comes down to things like signing a restaurant. If you're gonna go sign a Chinese restaurant, that's a traditional Chinese restaurant, you're probably gonna need someone on that sales team who can speak Mandarin. Because that might be actually what you encounter when you meet um, the owner of this multi-generational business on the other side of it. So a lot of what we think about is like, how do you hire for that? And how do we build teams that actually also just think outside of their own experience? So one of our other values is like, think outside the room and make room at the tables. How do you bring in those people? And we go our leaders on that. Mm. So at DoorDash today, if you're coming into our um, sort of annual calibration process and you're being considered for promotion to a director, one of the key things is going to be, have you built a diverse team? Have you built an uh, inclusive team? And we will get feedback on those things, and we have data on those things. And if you haven't, that's going to be a blocker. Because if you're going to lead in the company, we expect that that's what you're going to build. How do you outreach that? How do you find that? How do you cultivate that? To your point earlier, how do you keep that? Yeah. Because with a company like DoorDash, it makes sense, right? I'm going to, we're going to sign a Mexican restaurant or we're going to sign, uh, you know, a Spanish, yeah. a Spanish shoe store yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And so it would help to have people that 100%. do that. Do you chicken or egg it? Do you look for Spanish speakers and then go seek out that type of brand? Or do you say, this is the brand that we are looking at, we better get these speakers first? Yeah, I think you start first with the notion that like you're going to need these people, regardless of knowing what the pipeline looks like. Because if you wait for the restaurant to show up, it's gonna be too late. Okay. Like if you wait till you've identified the target, then like it's gonna take you months to hire this person, <laughs> right. but you're trying to sign the restaurant. So a lot of what you're thinking about is like you just build teams that at their core have to be diverse um, and have to have a diverse perspective and have to think about the world differently because that's just what it's going to take um, in a business like this, given who we serve. One of my favorite quotes is that talent hits a target no one else can hit, genius hits a target no one else can see. Mm -hmm. Where are you looking? Like what, you know, because of that instant gratification, that's never gonna change from the consumer's that's side. Right. So how are you staying a, a step ahead of us to see that thing that we might not see but puts you in this chair as the genius that has the foresight to say, they're gonna need that, the marketplace is gonna need that, this is coming next. Where, where does that genius come from and, 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 and what is it? Um, I think, honestly, I think a lot of it is just by listening to customers. Like it's, we have just found that if you, if you can anticipate, so one, there's a bunch of stuff that are like unexpressed. Okay. Unexpressed needs, right? So I was chatting with somebody about this yesterday. So if you take, for example, um, I'm, I sit on the board of an egg company and we're chatting at the board meeting yesterday and you're like, hey, how long does it take the eggs from when they come off the farm to when they're on the shelf to when they're in people's fridges. And it's like, do you know that? You may not know the exact number, but what do we think the customer expectation is there? They've never told us, but if we had to guess, it's probably very close. In the customer's head, if you had to ask them to articulate that, 
It'll probably be like a week. Yeah, soon. Yeah, soon. soon. <laughs> right. Instantly. I, instantly. Right. Like yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Chicken laid the egg. Let me <laughs> and, and I got it right now. Yeah. Right. So then you go, okay, like they've never told you that. But how do we make sure that that is true even if they haven't expressed it? And so a lot of what we think about is like identifying the things where people have actually given us the feedback and told us, but also the things that they may not be telling us that we can into it and start to say, okay, if we, for example, we understand that in a marketplace like ours, affordability will always be super important. And affordability will continue to be important until the end of time. Like we have to constantly drive the price of what it is to order food on DoorDash. So like that is an enduring quest, but how you do it will be different each time. And so one way we do it is through Dash Pass. Other ways we do it is through promos. Other ways we do it is through like dynamically rewarding people. So a lot of it's just knowing what are the enduring trends in a business like ours, but then what are the new ways to like fulfill those deeds. Do you find that what you're, what you're doing is being copied, is being mimicked by your competitors, right? In this competitive sure. land space, how do you stay a step ahead of like the Uber Eats? And, sure. and how do you, you know, how do you not only distance yourself from them, but also stand out to say, this is why you should be with us? Yeah, I think what we found is if over time, so look, these are very competitive categories. Right, so you should expect that like you launch a thing, someone else is going to launch a thing that looks like it. And that is the game that we're going to be in forever. Like if we sign a restaurant, our competitors will over time, once that exclusivity expires, if we ever have it, they would also have that restaurant. So in a model like that, how do you create loyalty and how do you create stickiness? I think it's like the combination of bringing all of these things together. Can you make it affordable? Can you have the most selection? Can you deliver it with quality? And when you get it wrong, can you make it right? And on all of those dimensions, which we measure, we consistently outperform our competitors. So if you, and all of those things start to compound, right? So if I have a tiny bit better selection, better affordability, do better on quality, do better on service, that starts to create a virtuous loop where people then think of me as much more reliable. And ultimately, like you're hiring me to solve a problem for you. So the last thing that can happen is that I create a problem for you, <laughs> yeah. right? Because you couldn't use it, there wasn't the right promo code, it didn't work. Um, the thing didn't get delivered, like all of these are bad experiences. And so for us, it's we really narrowed on that experience and how do we make it great every time. And then as a result, we've ended up building, you know, significant category share leadership. I could talk to you for hours and you are super compelling and I know people have been uh, taking notes and learning. It, with the remaining 30 seconds, would you like to slam any of your competitors? Absolutely or? not. You Absolutely not. Talk in glowing, in glowing <laughs> words about Nigerian soccer. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, but, but, any, but any last words in the, in the closing seconds of how a company that is really about instant gratification, right, that's taken that Domino's yep. 30 minutes or less and, you know, two weeks shipping and has, you know, built this, this empire of we'll get it to you now and we'll get it to you right. Just any last closing remarks for the audience? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing is like just never losing focus on the customer because they will tell you. They will tell you what they need. They'll tell you when they need it. And if you can stay plugged in, you can get ahead of that need. You can anticipate that need. And if you constant, consistently deliver on it, you win. The customer would tell you, Kofi Amu Godfrey just told you. <laughs> Thank you for having this conversation. Thank with you. Me. Thank you. My pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for the gift. Of course.